All right, so it looks like we have about 200 participants. We'll go ahead and begin. Uh, before we begin our meeting, I would like to acknowledge um, our UOG folks online. We have uh, Carlos Titano, who is the Administrative Director of Global Learning and Engagement. We have Amanda Bloss, who is the Administrative Supervisor of Global Learning and Engagement. And we also have three presenters. The first presenter will be Mr. Manny, Mr. Manny Hachinova. Uh, Dr. Andrea Sant and Dr. Marissa Bunton. So I'm going to pass, pass the floor to Amanda Bloss and she'll make her opening remarks. Again, you are attending Moto 6, I mean, Module 6, Moto, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Please stay um, on the chat and on the Zoom uh, for our evaluation as they conclude the presentation. Again, thank you for your time, and I will pass the floor now to Amanda. Good day, everyone. And on behalf of the University of Guam Global Learning and Engagement, um, thank you to Guam Department of Education for having us as part of your um, webinar training um, today. Um, I would also like to thank, of course, our, per, our presenters today, Mr. Manny Hachinova, Dr. Andreas, Andreas Sant, and Dr. Marissa Brown um, for being part of this today. Um, Mr. Manny will talk a little bit about the technical and OIT side of the Moodle um, platform while Dr. Andrea Sant and Dr. Marissa Brown um, will show you how they have used Moodle as their platform for the online classroom. Um, once again, to GDOE and to all of our teachers, thank you for having us. And we look forward to being a part of your, um, your new teaching journey this school year. Off day, so I guess that's my transition. Off day, everybody. My name is Manny Hachinova from the University of Guam. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you very much to our friends at the Guam Department of Education for making this possible. Um, wow, there's a lot of people in here. I'm so glad I don't see you all in a room because I would be so nervous. So it's nice. Uh, so hey, I'm going to talk to you about Moodle. Um, it's just uh, one of the things that we do. And we've been using Moodle here at the University of Guam for roughly about the uh, nine years. Uh, we started back in 2011 when I first returned back to university. So I'm um, sharing my screen with you now. You should be able to see our Moodle uh, login page. Can someone confirm that we can see that? Yes, we can yes, see it. We can see it. Great, thank you. All right, so one of the things technically that we had to do is one, um, of course, is the login. Like anything else, we had to do logins. Um, so what we found out was that it's nice to have options. Uh, right now we have the primary login goes through our active directory and um, that's just a, a local server that we have. We found out that when we would have to shut down our data center because of say a typhoon, uh, authentication couldn't occur. So what we did was we worked with our vendor, we use eThink Education and we worked with our vendor to set up an alternate uh, authentication method uh, the University of Guam is an MS Office uh, site, so we have all our emails that go through Microsoft Office. And so we could authenticate using what we call OAuth, Office Authentication. So it's a secondary, it's a secondary uh, solution. So if they don't remember these login credentials, which are separate from the Office login credentials, um, they'll log into the same account, right? Uh, we use Firefox. Uh, a lot of people have different choices in browsers. Um, uh, we like to say, uh, we like to choose Firefox just because it runs the JavaScripts uh, that are on Moodle a lot better. So oftentimes there'll be, if somebody misses a, uh, a submit button and they'll look at what, what web browser are you using, they'll say, oh, I'm using Chrome. Like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, the, the JavaScripts don't run properly. So uh, we usually tell our, our students and our faculty to please use Firefox. It's a, it's a free download off this site. Uh, mozilla.org, and they can download it for uh, Mac OS or for Windows. So we come into it. Uh, this is our platform. This is our main page that we use. Uh, our vendor keeps us pretty up to date on the version. We're using Moodle 3.8 right now. And the current, most current version that came out is 3.9. We'll probably make that switch over to maybe about the later part of this year to uh, early next year when we switch over to Moodle 3.9. Um, it's really easy. If you don't know what version of Moodle you're on, if you go to any page, uh, there'll be a Moodle documents. 
and that'll link you to a photo. I'll give you, I'll show you how to figure out, an easy way to figure out what Moodle version you're on. Um, and Moodle is very academic, so um, it's boring academic. And so it's very straightforward. This is what you do, this is where you go, this is, what, this is how you get into your class. Um, there's other learning management systems out there. There's Blackboard, there's Canvas, there's Desire to Learn, there's Sakai. Um, a lot of them are very GUI friendly. You know, they look like a Facebook or they look like a nice uh, group chat or uh, platform. Uh, but Moodle's really, uh, it's open source and we like that a, a lot about it. And because it's open source, there's a lot of white papers, a lot of YouTube videos out there. Uh, there are a lot of other universities that use Moodle. So for you to find a resource to share a link with your faculty or your students, say, how do I do this? You can, there's so much open source out there that you can find out. You can give people instructions on how to do things. The platform, the interface is pretty simple. Um, the hamburger stack that you see on the upper left-hand corner that I'm pointing at right now, uh, that, that's basically a toggle switch for this menu. So I can turn it on, turn it off. Uh, this main page allows us to put things here that we want students to be uh, seen uh, once they get to the page. Then my dashboard is basically list all the classes that I'm gonna be in, that I've been enrolled in. So here are all my classes. I can say my recently accessed courses. I can go to my course overview, sort these out by, by date. Um, now the courses and how your courses get into your classes or get into your session, that's a couple of ways that's done manually that we can create courses uh, manually for each of you. Um, but for as many classes there are for you guys, probably not the way to go. Um, when I ask people, they say, oh, how many sessions, how many courses do we offer at the university on any given semester? So we'll put that in the chat. Uh, I know we should have done that as a poll through Zoom. Zoom polls are pretty cool. But um, we'll put that as a chat and we'll let you guys think about that. And how many classes do you think is on the course schedule every semester? So if you look at the university course schedule and say, hey, you know, there's pages and pages. If you count all of them that are happening, how many do you think the university offers every semester? So if you have a guess, please do so, put it in the chat and we'll see how, uh, how well you get, how closest to the number, we're gonna do Price is Right rules, closest to the number without going over. Well, there is no prize, but you get bragging rights for today. And um, so there are a couple ways to do it. You can, we can either upload classes manually, which is a, it's a task in itself, or um, we can go to um, a bulk upload and it just takes a, like an Excel, uh, Excel spreadsheet file and that gets uploaded into the classroom as well. Um, the, um, the current numbers that you're putting in the chat are kind of low. So there's a hint, the current numbers in the chat for our class offerings every semester is kind of low right now. Um, uh, Moodle is not free for us. We, we pay for that and I'll talk about that in a little bit, thank you. So uh, classes can be multiple, uh, the, the few options you can do. You can do a bulk upload and that'll include the class shells and also the, um, the enrollment for the students. The ideal way is to link this, your Moodle site, into your um, student information system. So uh, there are a couple ways you can do it depending upon uh, who your vendor is, but a live link will allow you to have it be automatically created. So there's a course that's created in your student information system that will automatically create a course shell in Moodle, and then it'll enroll, live enroll, all the students in that class. So at the university, we also have an add drop period, as many of you know. And during the add drop period, that'll also change the participant listing in your uh, Moodle course. Uh, we're getting to that part at the university. We're, we're scheduled for a October, September uh, installation. And so we'll have it for in the spring. But it's the best way to manage for us. It's the ideal way to manage our classes and our student enrollment. Uh, for you guys, I would just jump straight into that type of integration because a bulk upload will get you there, but the management of the participants is gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge. And as for the, especially as many uh, students as you have, uh, it, it's gonna be, you, you would really, really be better off doing it uh, through an integrated setup. Um, our Moodle site, uh, through eThink, and let me just uh, go to our vendor. ethinkeducation.com. Uh, they help us out a whole lot. Uh, they help us a lot with our uh, technical support and our just 
upgrading and putting things into, into Moodle that we'd like to see. Um, for them, for our license, for our license, it's, um, we have a license for 5,000 seats and our annual cost is roughly about 30,000 a year. There's an escalation cost every year. We went up to a bid for this for up to five years. We're in year three and we started out at 30,000 and there's a 4% escalation cost each year. And that's what we get from them. Um, so this is Ethink and the nice thing I like about this vendor and when you start looking at different vendors, uh, we have a small staff at the university that maintains our online presence for us. So having a hosted vendor for us alleviates a lot of the back end support that we need to do and back end operations. So we just focus on the front end and the front end there's roughly four of us that uh, support 3,500 students and about 300 faculty. And it's a 24 seven operation for us. Uh, we, we offer help support through an email and, and phone calls. So during COVID, of course, it was a really challenge for us to do phone calls, but uh, the email has been the best one that we've had. So we are trying to manage, we're trying to put in some other methods of trying to contact us throughout the other days of the week, uh, like the weekends and holidays and during after hour support. So uh, Dr. Anita Enriquez, our senior vice president, would like us to in the fall shift to 24 seven support. Uh, normally we, we you know, gotta go to sleep sometime, right? So, um, we kind of stop it from about 12 till 8 in the morning. And, you know, it's nice that we have uh, understanding faculty and we just have rules. We just have rules for help support that response times have to be given within at least 24 hours for the initial response. And depending upon the, the requirement, you know, we let them advise the, the user if it's going to take more time. So our cost and our time of support have always been uh, a challenge for us, but uh, we're making it happen. And we, we make do with what limited resources we have. Uh, when compared to other LMSs, uh, Moodle is really much cheaper. If you've gone out and priced Blackboard or Canvas or Desire to Learn, at least for us as a university and for our student population, full time student population, we are looking easily eighty to one hundred thousand dollars annually for those for those learning platforms. So we went with Moodle. Moodle was just very simply affordable. And if I needed to find a Moodle administrator. Uh, a back-end administrator to handle everything, I couldn't pay them the annual fee. They would probably, it's a very specialized uh, uh, job. And so getting them 3,000 a year would not be enough. So hosting for us made sense. Our host also goes to an Amazon web service and it's on the, so Amazon, of course, AWS, Amazon web services go across many countries. So it just goes to the next nearest one uh, to us. And so there are, there are AWS data centers in Australia, Hong Kong, and in Japan, and they just bring us this just load balancing for them. So our performance, uh, when we look at a hosted a hosted vendor, uh, we have nothing to complain about. Uh, they give us 99.9% .9 uptime, and we're quite happy with the hosted service. Uh, there was the option to say, you know, why don't we host a Moodle server locally? You can, um, but you'd also have to provide all that backend support for that as well. Uh, so that's why we went with a, a hosted vendor. Uh, moving on, um, uh, let me show you some sample classes and some sample things that we do here in Moodle. Um, the sample class, we use this a lot. So this is our sample class that we use a lot for showing people how to do things. Um, you know, it's, it's very, like I said earlier, it's very academic. There's a lot of things that get done here and it's just straightforward to the point, you know, and how things are going to be loaded into, into Moodle. There are different ways of how you can offer your, offer your content in your class. You can go by topics, you can go by folder, um, and it just depends on how you want to offer your course content to your students. It's different, it's a different approach, and people will say, you know, I'll just take my classroom ideas and bring them online. As you learn from Dr. Sam and Dr. Brown, the pedagogy shifts kind of because now you're putting a lot of responsibility on the student to pay attention and to look at the content on their own. Uh, versus in class, you have a captive audience. And so having synchronous meetings versus asynchronous meetings, uh, it, it's a challenge. But there are ways around it, and we have a lot of best practices to offer you. And hopefully your experience will grow from your, your the first class is always going to be a challenge, and, and you're going to take a lot of notes and lessons about what's the best way to do things. And, you know, from our, from our experience, we'd be happy to share with you things that we've done. 
uh, each of you are going to be a unique situation. You know, your students are your students alone are going to create unique situations for you. Not only will it be in their ability to learn online, but their their access to resources as well. So understand that each class is going to be a, an individual experiment each and every time because the variables of the students are always going to change. But your content can just be your, your base and you can build off of that. So make sure you know, as you build off these things and you listen to some of the other four panelists that are on here today. That remember, your content is going to shift. Your content is going to shift to the pace of the class. And you, have, you really have that ability nowadays to add more things. So previously, if you're in the classroom and you had to find things to keep different sets of students or different groups of students occupied, wow, you can do that here quite easily by uh, sharing more content. So you're going to have some advanced students, you're going to have some students in the, in, the, in the back of the pack, middle of the pack, front of the pack, and usually in a classroom, you know, your classroom management skills are just trying to get everybody to this common media. But in an online classroom, you, know, you can really put more time for a lot of people um, into how they want to present things. Um, John's asking, hi John, good to see you again. John's asking a question, the difference between the paid version and the open source free version. The free version, of course, means you provide your own server, John. So you're going to provide your own backend support and technical support for that, for that server installation. The nice thing about it is that it's completely you and you can follow all of that. Um, but the hosted paid version, uh, they take care of all of those things for you. They take care of the patching, the updates, security, the backup, all of that's done by the host. So um, you would have all those responsibilities on the back end uh, for yourself to do those things. Um, uh, Helena, that's a, the, the purchase for the LMS. Um, I believe that's why we're having these discussions and that um, you know, they are going to be interested in purchasing at least one year's worth of hosting services from Moodle. And the, the nice thing about it is once your students become comfortable in this learning management, that whatever, whatever if they go to a post-secondary school, they have this learning management experience. And you know, if you learn Moodle, learning all the other types of learning management systems is pretty much like learning a new word processor. So they'll learn it quite easily where there's a short learning curve for them. All right, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, moving on technical side, uh, how much bandwidth do I need for Moodle? Uh, you know, when we went for, when we went to try to get student accounts, uh, student bandwidth accounts uh, for Moodle just to get onto online, we were recommending people to at least be 25 megabit connections. Um, you can get away with 10, but um, you know, the hard part is what kind of content are you gonna have? If you're gonna meet with your students online, and you have options for them saying, hey, um, um, I can't see a lot of the things. Helen, hi, sorry, Helen. Uh, I can speak up, but usually uh, if you need to increase your speaker for the Zoom, um, uh, that might be the reason. But is anybody else having audio uh, problems? OK. Um, please advise if you have any audio problems. And if you can hear me well, uh, but Helen, yeah, you just need to uh, maybe check your volume settings for your computer. All right. Um, so going back, uh, that some of the technical settings on the bandwidth. What do your students need? Uh, the students would at least need a 10 megabyte connection, and if they're using that at a shared, on a shared resource at home, um, some of you would have seen that you know that if there's other people uh, using the technical connection or using the internet connection at the house. Uh, performance on any application on any computer starts to degrade. Uh, the option to that is this, and let me just move this out of the way for me. The option to that is this. There is, uh, oops, come on. there is a mobile app version of Moodle, and the mobile app version allows you to use uh, Moodle offline. So the nice thing about Moodle offline is that while your students are in an active internet area where they can download stuff, they can download, they can download the, they can download the content, read it offline, participate in some uh, some forums offline. When they get back to an internet connection, they can they can sync. So uh, the app is free, and they have plans. You know, the plans are based on branding and things that you want to do online. But the basic app itself. 
is free for Android and iOS, and that's a branded app. But the free app on the Moodle app allows you to do offline learning, the same logins, and you can do push notifications and mobile-friendly activities. So it's a different shift as well, so that not only are you planning for having to then use content online through the, through the laptop or desktop computer, but you can also gear your content towards mobile applications. So if you know they're gonna say, hey, you know what, I, guys want, I want you guys to read this document, I want you to do this, you can also think about it, how it's gonna be for the mobile app. And we have some best practices for that and we help guide you on mobile apps. So if you have a community that is going to be predominantly offline, you can design your course so that they can do this uh, offline using an Android or iOS. So it's an option and uh, something you can think about as we look about developing your content and really looking at your audience and your students and say, hey, yeah, you need to use a mobile app, okay? So that's always an option for you as well. Other technical specifications are that if you're just using a, if you need to contact your students, you want to hold a, you want to hold a, uh, an online meeting with them. Uh, Moodle does not have a built-in meeting app that's not available. Uh, they don't have a synchronous meeting app. And you have a couple options uh, if you want to go offline or you want to go online and meet your students live. Uh, you do have Google Hangouts. So some of you have used Google Hangouts before. So um, that's an option for you. What we are working for at the University of Guam is this. And um, Uh, BigBlueButton.org is something that we've used uh, since October, and it's been a, it's been integrated into our Moodle. Uh, this is Big Blue Button. Uh, this you can install locally if you want. This is this is open source software as well. Uh, in our first year, we wanted to do it as a hosted solution, and just simply because we just wanted to see whether or not it could work, if it if it was going to fulfill our need. So. This is Big Blue Button. Um, you can talk to your IT tech and see if they can install this locally. We're also going to try to install it locally for us as well, and then expand it out to the other institutions. But um, this is one of the first options that we saw for hosted online meetings with the students. This is an HTML5 application, meaning that it's really reliant on your browser. Your, your web browser is critical. and um, uh, it just runs better on Chrome and Firefox. So we recommended that since we're using Firefox for Moodle, that you use Firefox for Big Blue Button as well. And we still strongly recommend using Firefox uh, as our learning management web browser. Uh, Becky is asking what are the advantages of Moodle over Blackboard or Canvas. Becky, the graphic, the user, uh, the user experiment, or user interface, sorry, the user interface in Blackboard and Canvas are entirely different than Moodle. Uh, they really look nice, the navigation is a little bit different, um, but really, Becky just came down to cost. Um, Moodle for us is costing, at our rate, for 5,000 active uh, users, is 30,000 a year. Uh, if I took that same quantity, uh, Becky, to Blackboard or Canvas, I'd easily be spending eighty to $100,000. So Becky is just down to cost, and what we can, what we can afford and what we can sustain. So. That's, you know, if we were a big university with lots of revenue, I could probably go with those other ones, but um, we have to <laughs> live within our own means, right? And you know as well as I do, you know, that's welcome to the government. All right. So um, what can we do in Moodle? What else can we do here? Of course, let me just, uh, on the right-hand side in Moodle, uh, we'll show you the technical side of edit settings. And these are all the options you can do uh, within the course as a teacher. And you can edit settings for the course. You can turn editing on. Uh, you can manage course completion tasks. And the course completion task really helps students visually identify how much work they've done in the class and how much work remains. Uh, you can set up the gradebook. This Moodle does a great job of setting up. You can set up your gradebook so that the activities link to the gradebook and students will always know that the current grade is in the class just by going to the gradebook without having to bother you about you know, what is my current grade in the class? So that's nice. That's one of the best features. As a faculty member, I truly appreciate not having to tell students, hey, this is the grade you're currently getting. All right. You have also some utilities as well, backup, restoration. And the really, really cool thing about, um, about uh, Moodle, sorry, just reading a quick question here, about cool thing about that I enjoy about Moodle is this fact that I can 
I can back up and restore courses, right? So I can archive my classes uh, for historical sake, so as I can archive it. But the really, really cool thing is being able to import that if you spend the time on this year developing your course content, the next time you offer the same class, you can import that content into your current class. And that's a game changer for a lot of people. You know, I'm not sure, and you're asking, uh, Martha's asking about the differences and highlights between Google Classroom. Martha, my Google Classroom experience is kind of limited. I've played with it a few times. I think it's really nice, um, but I don't know if this feature is there as well. And I think it is. I think you can duplicate classes. I think there's a feature in Google Classroom you can duplicate classes. But in Moodle, we use a feature called import. And the import feature for us doesn't bring over student data. And for us, we wanted to keep student data within the term that that class is offered. So thanks, Loretta. Loretta is offering that. Yeah, you can duplicate classes. Thanks. So the import feature really helps us manage the content and it, it doesn't take long. You know, it, can, it doesn't matter how much classes you have or how, how much content you have in the class. I can easily import everything that you want into the classroom. And just, it's really just making a duplication of the course without student data. So all the logs really, so the course logs get refreshed, everything gets refreshed and you get to segment uh, the classes within their own time. So that's really nice. Um, the reset button here is really, really cool as well. If you had no, if you were just teaching a training session and you know, you don't have to just use Moodle just for classrooms. We use Moodle also for training, uh, staff training, employee training, whatever we, you know, for something other than non-academic, uh, we use it for training and we can reset it. So there's a course that you have, everybody just had to go through this course and we're done. I, I backed up the course just for archiving purposes and I can reset the course keeping the same link and we're good to go. So a reset will take the existing course and just clear every day, uh, refresh, gradebook, participant list, just reset everything and take everything out. So that's what a reset does for us. Uh, there are other more options here that are available to faculty. And um, you know, we're, we as a, as a hosted vendor, we don't have full, what we call root access into our, into our system. We have what's known as client admin. And we don't see everything, but that's fine. What happens is that if we need to install a plugin, for example, and you say, hey, can you install this plugin? Uh, we send a message off to our, uh, to our vendor and they have it done within 24 hours. It's really, really nice having a vendor that's, uh, that's very supportive. So the, anything on the back end that we used to have to do ourselves is now handled by our vendors. So that includes plugin. A Moodle plugin, that's really cool. So a Moodle plugin is this. Uh, let me just Google search uh, Moodle plugin. I ah, can't type, you guys are making me nervous. That and haven't had lunch yet. I'm going to eat lunch after this. <laughs> because it's open source, there's a, really a large community of people who, who try to provide adaptations into Moodle. So plugins, plugins are a way of creating and bringing in third party software and applications into Moodle. So for example, big blue button, that's an activity for us. All the faculty member has to do is enter, create an activity, create a big blue button activity, and that's it. We also have Turnitin. Uh, Turnitin is a plagiarism checker. Um, uh, we use that a lot uh, at the university. And if we, instead of trying to tell students, hey, you know what, we're just checking for plagiarism, we actually wanna show them it's a writing tool to help them show how much of their paper has been referenced versus how much is their original work. So the English department is really one of our biggest users, but we're also finding it a good success for Turnitin with our science classes to make sure students aren't just copying each other's lab reports. So the Turnitin uses both a, an internet check for those globally, but we also have a local repository of all the work students have done for the past repository six years. So our, our six-year repository, if somebody has done that work and the similar work in the same six years, it'll flag it as well. So that's nice. So any other type of uh, um, things that you can search for a plugin, yeah, it's uh, all you simply have to do is ask your vendor to install it for you. So go search moodle.org.plugins and you can see there's a ton of it. So uh, there's many, there's many plugins and you can see whether or not if that's something to task. So there's something that you see within Moodle to say, hey, I, oh, I wish I could do that. Uh, there's usually a plugin for it. 
Uh, one of the coolest things that we also like to do in Moodle is oftentimes you want to see within, within Moodle, uh, you have to play your own detective. You have to play your own detective to see uh, with students, what have they done? And the students tend to forget the system logs track everything. So if we're looking to see whether or not if a student has been active in a course, if we're looking to see whether or not the students collaborated on an assessment, you know, say, oh, did you collaborate on a quiz? The logs will tell us everything. So th in this sample course, I can get the logs for, say, uh, this person. I can see everything that they've done. I can get these logs. And it tells me everything that they've done in this class. It gives me a date and time. tells me what they've done in the class and the IP address that they came from. So I can take all of this information, I can look at it just online, or I can download it and do even further analysis. So the logs are there. These are all system generated logs that keep track of everything that the student has done on the site. Uh, that's really helpful for us, particularly if a faculty member is really curious about, you know, if a student says, oh, you know what, I tried to do this activity, but it wasn't available. And uh, the logs, uh, <laughs> logs don't lie. If there's anything from today that you're going to remember, logs don't lie. And faculty have access to logs. So it's not some special secret that the IT techs have. It's just going to be you go into the reports, they can see uh, what's available uh, for the course, and you can actually see logs, right? So that's one of the things. The other way is, you know, particularly with your demographic, is to look at badges. Uh, badges help students, it's, it's gamification. You know, a lot of students, in here, especially even for us, uh, they like badges. Badges are, you know, hey, you got a badge. And a badge just kind of means a sense of accomplishment, that you've done something, there was something, activity that you wanted them to complete, and there's a badge. So you can, you know, when you look at the student profile, you'll see what badges they've completed, you get notified about these badges, and badges help students and as they move throughout, it's part of their profile as well. So as they move through other classes and you're saying, oh, from other teachers, well, did you complete, you know, did you complete this work in your other class? And, and it'll say, yes, if they got the badge. The badge signifies completion. Uh, the question is, uh, Connie's asking, will logs show plug-in activities? Uh, sure, uh, the logs will show any activity in the classroom. So if you have an active activity in the classroom, Connie, it'll show if the students click on that activity. And oftentimes they'll say, hey, you know, I tried to, I clicked on it, but it didn't work. I'll go back to the logs, no, you didn't click on it. It, <laughs> it didn't work because you didn't click on it. Or they'll say stuff like, um, you know, sorry to be a pessimistic here, but they'll say, oh, I, I tried to log into Moodle and it wasn't, it wasn't online. And I'll go into Moodle and I'll see, I have how many people active online right now. So it's not you. I mean, it's not us as a site. It's just whatever connection you're trying to do isn't online, that you don't have an internet connection. So something else is blocking you from getting into Moodle. Like for example, I could go home and I'm gonna go out to the main page. And from the main page, you know, I'm an administrator. And so I can see this right now, this is for me. But if I wanna see how many users I have online right now, I can go, I can go to my site administration. As an administrator, I can do this. I can look at, I can browse my current users and right now, I have quite a lot of users on. So I have a lot of users on from the last four seconds to the last few minutes. So each page roughly shows 25. And generally, <laughs> generally we have oftentimes at least a thousand users online at any given time. So yeah, we have a lot of users on. So if somebody says, you know, I can't log into Moodle, your site is down. I reply back to them and I say, yeah, tell the other 2,000 people that are online right now that Moodle is down. So it kind of shuts down the conversation really fast and tells them that, no, it's not, you're not going to try to come up with an excuse. So yeah, the excuses don't change no matter if you're K-12 or higher education, the excuses still come. Um, so at least the logs help you as a, as a faculty member to say, you know, it's, it's working. I can't tell you anything different, but it's working for all the other students except for you and that the troubleshooting now has to become a little bit more uh, refined to say, okay, what exactly is the problem? What web browser are you using? Do you have internet access? Uh, so do you have the latest Java version installed? So um, 
those are the things that have to be that have to be dealt with. All right. Um, other th cool th technical things on Moodle, um, we get to put a lot of resource blocks. And so this resource blocks, there is a there is a template theme that we can manage. And so as administrators, if you wanted to have a set resource block appear in every page in every course, just so that students can say, hey, uh, I don't have to go back to this page, but we have we do have fixed resources that students can go to and that they can say, oh, okay, hey, yeah, here we go for student services, student policies, library services, whatever they need. Uh, this is a persistent block in all classes. So as administrators or as program chairs or department chairs, if you feel that there are set resources that your students should always have access to, regardless of the class, you can have, you can design fixed blocks within them. Other than that, the other blocks that are here for activities, these are customizable. Uh, your faculty can customize everything that you want to see uh, within the course. Um, the other cool thing about Moodle is that I can always change my role. I can change my role so that I can see what the students are going to see. I can change my role to a student and go to a student view and say, okay, here's what the student sees. That's all they see. Oh, okay. Here's that's it. So you can say, ah, oh, okay, instead of having to find a student account, log in as a student and then see what you say, ah, oh, okay, um, the student role and being able to exchange, uh, transfer your role back and forth is really convenient because I can just return to my normal role and then I can, okay, these are the changes I need to make. So cool. Um, going back to plugins, one of the plugins, you know, earlier I said we we're a Microsoft Office shop, so MS Teams is part of our Microsoft Office package. And Dr. Sant and Dr. Brown will appreciate this. Uh, not only do we have a link, you can create links for Big Blue Button, but I can also create an activity for an MS Teams meeting. So for, the, for some of you, you say, okay, so what's the difference and why options? The cool thing about MS Teams and a live meeting is that I have uh, auto captioning. So there is, they have live captioning on MS Teams automatically. It's using an AI program and an artificial intelligence program, and it does live captioning for us automatically. The transcripts don't get saved, uh, but if you record the session, then the transcripts get saved with the recorded session. Um, the GM call, sorry, uh, I'm just looking at the question. Uh, that's gonna be interesting. That's a, that's a nice technical question. Um, uh, that's gonna be based on the host. If you, the question is on the, on the question Q and A is asking, would, would you, do we have a central Moodle site or will it be uh, diversified between the different districts and the different schools? Uh, that's a good question. And that still has to be uh, addressed on the technical level and it has to be addressed to say whether or not if, uh, the, the front pages will be different or if there's anything to be any, it's still gonna be a technical question as far as access and bandwidth to each of, that, each of the sites. So, uh, that's a question that will probably be answered later on. Uh, ideally, what's going to happen is going to be transparent. It will be transparent to you. It doesn't, it shouldn't matter. But I think uh, it's going to be a, a nice question to say, how do you want it to go? So for us, for UOG, uh, we only have one site. That's moodle.uog.edu. Really easy for the students to remember. Um, branding for you guys, it's going to be by school and then GDW. Uh, GU, you know, whatever it's going to be, we're going to try to see what the branding is going to be. So uh, it's a technical question, and it's just going to be how, how the administrative uh, tasks are going to be handled uh, through the different sites. Uh, for me, it's nice having one site because we're going to have global parameters throughout all of it, and it's done. If we had separate sites, uh, administrative management has to be done on each site, so that's going to be a challenge that way. Um, the second question is the assigned staff to handle building. You know, um, at the University of Guam, that staff of four <laughs> and those everybody. And so that's the, that's the million dollar question for GDOE uh, that we're going to try to figure out. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to work on is a consortium uh, throughout through the three institutions, GDOE, GCC, and UOG, that will provide uh, customer or technical support for two institutions. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, everybody's going to try to chip in what they can and provide that solution. Uh, it takes a while for, for the technical support. You know, uh, I've, my staff's been doing this for nine years, 
uh, and to bring new people in. There's going to be a learning curve for new technicians coming in, so uh, we're going to try to handle that as best we can. But the idea here is a shared uh, consortium of clinical support resources that will provide ac administrative access into each of our systems. So um, there will always at least be one representative from each of the uh, schools online. So hopefully that'll, that'll help us and provide you the support that you need. Uh, we're getting some additional help for the university side uh, just for this school year, um, but you know, we still need to figure out how to help you guys as well. But that's the approach that I'm going to be offering uh, your IT staff and as well as the IT staff at GCC that we propose a, a consortium of technical support hours uh, that will be provided for, for all institutions at 24-7. So that's an idea that's being processed and we hope we can make that happen. Okay, thank you. That was a good question. All right. Um, so that's live captioning. The other thing about it that you need to consider, and uh, I wanted to bring this up before I forget, is fair use of, of open resources. Or, you know, you, you, a lot of you have resources of your own from your personal libraries that you bring into Moodle. And you want to bring them into Moodle. So whatever you want to do, if you have videotapes, if you have uh, DVDs that you've had before and you say, oh, I used to play this for my, for my students when I get into class. Uh, you can still do the same thing. You know, there's still some, some leverage in the Fair Use, Fair Use Act. And because we're education sites, uh, we, can, we can say that these videos that we upload are only going to be viewed uh, by a select group of students. And the caveat there is that you don't have it on there for, for a long duration. If you say, hey, today we're watching a video, the video only becomes available for that day. And then the link is disabled. Uh, that's one of the ways that we get through and making sure that the copyright uh, is still being followed and that we're still trying to do our best to re reduce ways where uh, the electronic version of files can't be duplicated or can't be downloaded. So we have some methods that we use uh, to prevent the downloading and copying of sites. But the best way really is just to uh, limit it to the, the students who are in the classroom and make the link expire after a short period of time. Don't leave it on forever. The longer, we, the longer you leave that electronic resource exposed, um, the greater the risk increases. So uh, please be careful, be careful with copyrighted information. Uh, but remember, there's a bunch of open education resources out there. If you just Google OER, resources, uh, you'd be surprised at how much free content you can actually put up and maintain as part of your course content. Um, the other thing too that we can, that a lot of people can do is, uh, is put in uh, videos. Uh, the nice thing about it and is you can always link to a, a YouTube video. Um, you can link to all these links externally without any, without any problems, right? You can just insert a new link. So when we add an activity or resource, and this is where somebody was asking earlier, one of the differences between uh, Google Classroom and Moodle is I can add a lot of stuff. There's a lot. We use it all? Probably not. And there's a lot of things that uh, you'll just say, you know what, that's fine. I can just do the minimum. But for us, activities are simply things that you want the students to do. And the two categories are activities and resources, things you want them to read. Um, in the activities, I can create assignments for them. They can, they can upload an assignment. I can filter out the type of files that I get for them. I can put dates. I can put, wow, I can put grade points on it. I can mark it up. I can go through when they submit something. I can mark it up, put my comments as if it was, if I was writing it on paper. A lot of, a lot of faculty, they say, hi, oh, I miss having the ability to write stuff on a paper. Well, Moodle, when you go through an assignment and it converts it to a PDF, you get to put stuff, uh, put notes, comments, ah, highlight stuff, put little smiley faces, check marks, bad marks, whatever you want to do. And you can put feedback comments uh, for the students as well. So there's a lot of opportunity to still engage with the student on, on activities that they submitted. And you'd be surprised how much easier it is grading things online and highlighting points in areas within the document itself to say, this is exactly where you need, as if it was being done on pen and paper. Uh, the nice thing about it too is there's a notification tab uh, enabled. So once you finish grading it, 
the student gets notified, hey, I, you got your, your term paper or your draft paper was, was uh, graded. So they get notified as well. You don't have to worry about notifying them. Uh, attendance is a really cool feature in Moodle. Uh, the attendance feature, you can set that up. You can have students check their own attendance. You wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> but you can do attendance on your own and you can just quickly do attendance. It takes it in, goes right into the grade book and your attendance tracking is done. Uh, we do have links into other LTIs. So an LTI, a Learning Technology Interconnect, is done through, um, um, is done through our, our vendor. So if you have a publisher, you have something that says, oh, I, I wanna do it through an LTI integration. Yep, you can do that as well. And LTI allows us so that if I have a service that's a third party service to Moodle, the student's login is passed through to that site. So once they log into Moodle, that third party service will recognize the Moodle login and say, hey, welcome back, Manny, what can I do for you? So we use that Cengage as of course a publisher and that publisher works really well for us. One of the recent ones we have is uh, Red Shell that we just finished and that's eBooks. So there are a lot of eBook publishers uh, that are available and for maybe one third the cost of the books. So I can of course do chat. There's, you can select choices. Uh, you can help them do a, build a database, external tools. These external tools are third party systems that we use like VoiceThread and turn it in. Um, that was one of them before, but turn it in has its own activity now plugin. So a lot of external tools can be used. Um, feedback, we can do our forums over here as well. Uh, we have another uh, third party software called Labster. Labster allows us to do virtual science labs. Uh, this is really cool because it has both science engineering and um, microbiology as one. That, that was really cool. Uh, you, you can develop lessons. A lot of you have very sequential things on how to do things in your content that you can't proceed unless it's, um, there's a prescribed set of activities I need to do in order to complete this activity, and that's lessons. Uh, mind mapping is a new approach to saying how, if you want to say in content mapping, how do, how do students want to think about something? So you take a word and you start building the word clouds from that. Um, as a mind map option, and it just another way to help you uh, engage with your students. Uh, you can do quick questionnaires about stuff. You can, of course, do a quiz. Quizzes are great. I can put so many things on a quiz that tell them um, uh, how to do things in a quiz. Ah, sorry, reading question. Uh, yeah, if you want to use Moodle for SOs, you can use it for student organizations as well. Uh, it's a nice place for a repository for them. And if you, and if they all have access, it makes it even that much easier. Uh, other things that we do on Moodle, uh, you can see that we do things here. Let me switch screens here. Um, oh, that's not going to be. Can you still see my screen? Yeah, right. You can still see my screen, right? I have to drag it off. Are you still good? My sharing is paused. Oh, paused. Yes, we can hear. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop share for a moment here. I need to switch screens here. Um, okay. uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, there's another one for the, that I missed earlier for the OER. Uh, you would just Google Open Education Resources and then you get a ton of websites for that. Um, Moodle being used by student organization for the clouds. Yeah, you know, I would do that. I would, you can do that as well. You can use it for non-academic things. And I think that's a nice way to get students more integrated into the learning platform so they can see that they can use it for different reasons. Uh, with Power of Teacher Gradebook, uh, Yoshi, thanks, good question. It's a technical question that we have to go back to the vendor on both sides. So we need to contact the Power School and is it Power School? I think using Power School, right? Not Power Teacher, Power School, and go back to Power School and check if Power School is compatible with Moodle and if your vendor can allow for that integration. Uh, I'd like to say yes, and, but that's just me saying that we're probably not the first school who's done it. And they probably be saying, yeah, we've done it, we do it before, we can do it quite easily. So um, yeah, but it just needs technical confirmation. All right, I noticed I'm running out of time here and that's my time. So, uh, you know, there's so much to learn about Moodle and, um, you know, Dr. Sant and Dr. Brown will attest that, you know, <laughs> this is tip of the iceberg stuff and that your experience alone is going to help you become that uh, proficient in using it. 
Uh, we wanted it, you know, we, the larger community that we get on Guam about using Moodle um, just helps us say and gives us ideas on how things act. And I'm learning, I'm learning new things every day. Uh, Dr. Sant teaches me new things every day. <laughs> she laughs, I know she's laughing. Um, but it's nice having really great discussions and people who have this opportunity to, to at least learn more about, here's an idea, here's how I use Moodle. And on, on the technical side, you know, saying, hey, Manny, how can we do this? And is it possible? And that's me going back to our vendor or me looking at other things and how I can make them happen. And I have no problem saying no, <laughs> but I always preface that, you know, we're going to try to see if we can have it. And if there's a no, then I say, you know, either we just can't, we don't have compatibility with it, or it's just too expensive an option that we can, can't afford it. All right. Um, Eloise. Yeah, oh, my sister Eloise, good to see you. Uh, I hope so. I hope we start doing more follow-up trainings with you and getting more, you know, it's hard to give one-on-one -on -one trainings with all of you and we're probably going to follow a trainer trainer approach, but we'd like to establish more community meetings and it doesn't have to be just GDOE, but it's community meetings with all three institutions to help each other. There she is. Hi, Eloise. Good to see you. Smiley. Thank you, sister. Um, but it's nice Hi, Yanni, how are you? And again, uh, on behalf of all of us and our teachers and, and the Department of Education, we want to take this opportunity to really um, thank you and the team. I know that we've been talking about this way back in 2011 when we first met and started talking about the idea of, of you know, using Moodle, a different platform for all of us to kind of be working with. So I think the time is now. And uh, again, I, I know that our teachers are all willing and able to really take the next step on how we're going to use technology in the area of online, uh, uh, you know, the online platform. So thank you so much to you and everybody else. You're welcome. Thanks. Good to see you. Um, yeah. So with that, you know, it, it's going to tip of the iceberg stuff. And I hope, you know, we can, you know, we can still meet with this in a, as a community level and, you know, get more, get more ideas out here. And, and as you go through uh, the, the next semester, uh, just, we like to have more open conversations and it's just going to help us be, uh, give a better product and service to all of our students and to share ideas. So uh, I'd like to, you know, this is the idea we're going to throw out there to say we're going to start a Guam mug, you know, uh, mug, Moodle user group. Ha 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 ha. And, you know, this is the starting, you know, when, when we started our Guam mug, uh, Guam user groups. There are other, so many things about having a, a they call it a Moodle moot, M-O-O-T. And uh, a Guam mug is G, the starting point. So who knows, you know, if it's gonna be this way for a while, so we're just gonna adjust to the new normal and really find platforms for us to share uh, core ideas and start branching out. So I wanna thank once again, uh, our friends from Glee, the Global Learning and Engagement Center. Thanks to uh, Carlos Titano and Amanda for helping schedule all of this. But my time is up. I see people waving at me and the time is going back, running out of time and well, running out of time. But uh, I want to give Dr. Sant and Dr. Brown uh, a big thanks for helping us uh, continue these panels. So have a great day, everybody. Happy Thursday to you. And I hope to see you guys real soon. I guess it's my turn. Hello, this is Dr. Andrea Sant. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be in front of so many teachers. I agree with many that if I was in the Hyatt or the Hilton ballroom in front of 238 folks, I would be feeling the nerves, and I still am, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. All right, I'll just begin with a brief introduction. Again, I'm Andrea Sant. I've been at the University of Guam for 14 years, and for the last eight of those, I've been teaching online. About 50% of the classes that I teach are now online. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. During my sabbatical, I had the support of the university to go out and get some certification. I have an online teaching certification and a faculty developer certification as well as a voice thread instructor certification. I'm currently the chair of the Masters of English degree program and I've been teaching writing, research, and literature in the Division of English and Applied Linguistics for 14 years. I'm happy to be here um, and enjoy uh, join this discussion. I'm gonna be sharing my screen. I have a few prepared remarks, but the bulk of what I'm gonna share with you 
is um, a course tour. Before I get too far along though, let me just check whether or not my audio is loud enough. Is everybody hearing me okay? Yes, I hear you fine, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I'll begin with my screen share. All right. Okay, so um, you might be able to, at the top of your moot or your Zoom page, change the orientation so you can move the um, participants out to the side. Um, if some of this presentation gets cut off for you, feel free to adjust your screen so you can see it better. All right, so I've done my introduction. This is the overview of what I'm going to be sharing again. Uh, three distilled pieces of advice as you endeavor into Moodle learning and teaching. A tour of an online course that I've taught for eight years now. And a few resources for the road to leave you with. All right, here are my nuggets of advice. Keep it simple and focused. Make it reusable and duplicate with permissions, of course and incorporate rather than recreate. And I'll unpack each of these. And forgive me, I need to kind of look down at my notes every once in a while. All right, keep it simple and focused. So there are lots of different options in Moodle, but you don't have to do them all, and you don't have to master them all. Choose one or two and do it very well. Be consistent, and your students will appreciate it. I use just between three to four methods of delivering my content, my curriculum to my students. And I also only have about three to five uh, activities that I require students to complete on Moodle. Um, and I do this consistently so that they build their confidence in how to utilize Moodle as a place to learn and as a place to submit their work. So and that's my first tip. Number two, make it reusable. And this um, particular uh, advice comes out of the fact that uh, we don't know what's going to happen with uh, the current state of emergency that we're in right now, but whatever you do now, this investment in online teaching can be an archive of audio, video, curriculum that you can continue to use regardless of what happens in the future. So make it reusable. That means that when you do record videos or audio, I'd encourage you to remove all of the semester or day specific information, like uh, a date perhaps, or this assignment is due next Tuesday. If you remove all of that information, you can use your audio and videos in the next semester or in an, another class. So keep that st strategy in mind. Um, save some of that housekeeping course business uh, outside of recorded videos or narration. And then you can continue to replicate or reuse materials. And the third nugget, nugget of advice I have is to duplicate with permission and incorporate rather than recreate. And this comes out of the fact that there are so many online resources available to teachers. These are videos from YouTube, um, PBS, all of these wonderful resources. And Moodle allows you to incorporate that material into a course. So if it's out there and somebody has already done it, how to write a thesis statement, how to create paragraphs, a five paragraph essay, I'm a literature <laughs> professor, so those are my examples, then utilize those. You don't have to recreate those if you find um, another professor or teacher out there who's recorded something that works perfectly well. All right. Um, I also want to just share in terms of the duplicate, as I first started learning Moodle, a lot of what I learned was um, both from Manny, of course, um, and uh, Professor Brown, who will be speaking, Professor Marissa Bunton, who will be speaking next, um, but also YouTube. YouTube was a great resource. All you need to do is type in Moodle, and then the version that you'll be using, UOG uses version 3.6, so you might check and see uh, what Moodle version GDOE has. 
Okay, with screen share, I'm not seeing questions, so I'm afraid if, if anybody has questions, um, hold off on them a little bit, or um, feel free to um, uh, make them uh, audio, audio um, say them out loud. But if I don't hear anything, I'm going to keep on rolling. Okay. I'm moving now into my tour. This is a drive-by view of a class that I've been teaching asynchronously for about eight years. Asynchronous, this means that I don't require my students to log in at any particular time. Um, and they do have specific deadlines, but we don't meet, say, Tuesdays at 2 o'clock every week. So asynchronous, they might log in at 2 a.m. if that's their schedule. So this is an asynchronous course. Um, all of the software that I'll, I'll be showing you that is embedded or utilized in the course is freely accessible to my students and easily downloadable. And then you'll notice in, in the course that I'm about to show you that I've chunked it into four units. This is a four-month class, a semester-long class, four units. And in each of the units, I utilize the same strategies for content delivery and student activities. Again, this is to keep it simple for students and so that they build confidence as they continue to use Moodle to submit their work and learn from me and from their, their classmates. All right. Okay, this is actually where I'm going to pause and shift to a new screen. So I think I have to stop screen share for a moment and go back and we'll see if this works. So hopefully now you are seeing my EN213 screen. Can somebody verify that you're seeing my Moodle EN213 class? I can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Marissa. All right. So in this class, the first thing I'm going to do is actually switch my view so that you will see it as students see it. All right. I have it set up now for uh, the first day of class, August 19th, for us at UOG. And this is what they're going to see when they log in to my EN213 Literature, Myth, and Culture for class for the first day. Up here at the top, I keep a running schedule. I update this twice a week. What's new, what's due, what's next. Right below it, I have a voice thread presentation. This is uh, embedded in Moodle, and there's a free version available to you um, for everybody. You can use voice thread for free. Students have access through my Moodle site. They don't have to have any separate login. Uh, VoiceThread is basically a narrated PowerPoint, so each slide has audio. I'm not sure it's going to play, um, but we can try it. Sometimes it'll only play the audio that is available on my computer, but we can try. I'll go ahead and click Welcome play. to EN 213 Literature, Myth, and Culture. Whether okay, you should have heard something. If you don't, it's just a glitch with my microphone on my particular laptop. But this is what it looks like. It'll fire up. Students can open it in a new tab. They can make it full screen. What I like about this is that they can pause, um, take a break. They can repeat a slide. Going through, they can listen to it again. Um, also, I've got this one set up so students can participate. This little icon, I don't have this one set up for it, um, but in some cases you can set it up so students, you'll ask a question and you can get responses. Okay, that's VoiceThread. This is the primary technique that I use to deliver my course content. All right. Um, I have my syllabus, my schedule, other things I have here on the top of my Moodle course page are a news and transcript archive. In my news archive, I have the transcript to that audio presentation I just showed you. In order to be ADA compliant, I realized that everything that I speak
speak, any audio or video recording, I need to have a transcript for. I do this by just scripting myself and reading it out loud. Um, hopefully, though, you might have a compliance officer at your school or some savvy student instructors or TAs that can help you with that if you have students in need of those services at your school or institution. All right, back down here. Question and conversation corner. I use this particular forum to avoid answering 14 emails where students ask the same question. And I learned this technique from Professor Brown. Uh, she's the one who um, clued me into this. It's a good time saver. You can't, students aren't able to hear the questions because they're not all sitting in the same classroom. They might all have the same question though. So when I get an email of a question um, that I know other students will benefit from, I have them posted here to the question and conversation corner. And here I've just begun the conversation with a knock knock joke. All right, I know I need to move a little more quickly here. All right, that's the top of my page. You'll notice that I have this set up in folders. I have the four units. There are certain things that are not available to my students. I want to just give them a little material at a time. I don't want them to be overwhelmed with everything. This is a course, again, that I've taught for eight years. Everything that from those previous years is on this Moodle shell. I had Manny um, and his crew duplicate it for the next semester. And again, this is one of the wonderful things about Moodle that this is possible to archive and duplicate for multiple uses. But again, I only have them accessing unit one for the first week of classes. Here I've got a folder for their first assignments, knowing that they might be still collecting their books. So here's what they'll read the first week or so. And the first week, I will have them introduce themselves in this forum. I've asked them a few questions, and everybody will just add a new topic and introduce themselves. And we can get to know who's in this community. And the last thing that I have my students doing the first week or so of class is taking a quiz. This is a quiz that is over the class syllabus and schedule. I want to make sure that they are reading that material. So I have this set up for them. Um, so I don't have to. I know sometimes in a face-to-face -face class on the first day, you talk through the expectations, the course assignments. I do that through my welcome presentation and then forcing them to read the syllabus and the schedule by giving them this quiz. All right, let me go back and introduce a few more features here. Got a bit of a delay. Thinking about it. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm gonna switch my view now and return to my teacher, teacher mode. And I'm also going to switch on my editing. All right, now this is the view where you'll be able to see how much more is on this page. I've got a folder with MLA, dial guides and resources, as well as quiz, quizzes. I've got addition, additionally in unit one, they have more voice threads to listen to, 20 minute lecture, 16 minute lecture. They have more quizzes to take. They have an exam to complete, etc. Unit two is fully occupied with all of these things as well. And again, you can see this is a fully populated course, but they don't see all of this at once. I think it would be too overwhelming. And it's something that you build over time, a little at a time. And really you only need to stay a day, a step, an hour ahead of your students um, in order to be really professional and look really good. Um, I said just a moment ago that one uh, way that I keep it simple 
is to make sure that each unit of my course uh, practices the same content delivery and student activity. So unit two, you'll see I've got a voice thread. Students will read materials. I've got a few videos here in this mythology class that they can watch. They'll take quizzes, participate in discussions. And this is discussions with each other around a specific question that I've asked. They'll submit a paper. This is a five paragraph short paper. I've provided them with a sample of what I expect in this paper. And I've done that by using track changes to embed these balloon notes. And I found that when I create sample student papers and really highlight my expectations, the quality of the work increases exponentially and saves me significant, significantly on grading time. And exams. So again, each unit they take, they read, they watch lectures, they read stories, they watch lectures from me, they take quizzes over the reading and the lecture materials, they practice the new terminology and demonstrate that they've done their reading through discussion forums and quizzes, they practice writing skills and uh, vocabulary in short papers. And then there's a quiz. That's how I set up all the units. And again, uh, they practice these skills, these moodling skills, being able to complete a quiz, uh, post a forum within the first two weeks of, of my class. And then we just continue to build. So nothing new um, emerges in terms of now you have to uh, create your own voice thread or something uh, like that. Okay, so that's a view of my class. There's just one other thing, a tip for, and many mentioned this, um, I'll um, just iterate, to save yourself time. Uh, again, one thing that I do is make sure all of my units are identical in terms of content delivery and student activities. But once I have one unit set up, I go through and I just duplicate it. So I've got, here's my quiz. I've got all the directions here laid out. Again, this takes a moment. Then I go here to the edit and I duplicate it. I'm not gonna press it because it takes two or three minutes, but it will duplicate the questions as well as the directions. Um, this saves me so much time. So then I can just go through to the duplicated quiz, update the specifics as to the dates, and then I'm done. So set up one unit with what you need, duplicate those activities, and save yourself time. All right, that is a drive-by very fast uh, sightseeing tour of my Moodle shell for a course that has a lot of bells and whistles, um, but I'm happy to discuss more of it if you saw anything here that you have questions about in a moment. I'm gonna go back, stop share for a moment, go back to my other PowerPoint and finish this up. So I saved time for Professor Bunsen. All right, that was a tour of my class. So the next slide. All right, where we're at now, this rush in our pandemic world to translate face-to-face -face brick and mortar classrooms to the online environment, environment is what scholars are calling emergency remote teaching. And it's not the same thing as um, well-developed online course curriculum. In our environment of emergency remote teaching, we have less time for planning and course development. Uh, we may have, we may uh, lack assistance to design um, Moodle help uh, or uh, resources. Support systems for faculty and students may be limited or unavailable. Not all faculty will be comfortable or excited about this transition to online teaching. Our time 
may be limited. We just learned from GDOE that we're going online. You know, these we were hoping for the best, but we're planning to accommodate um, our students the best ways we can. Um, and it's it's a dynamic situation, so time is limited to do the best work we can. And um, when we're rushing to translate face-to-face -face material, we often have to just go with one technique, one style, um, and without accommodating all of the student learning diversity that we have in our classrooms. So this is the environment with, that we are in. And I know people are maybe feeling cynical, uh, feeling pessimistic, but I, I really think this is an opportunity. There's a silver lining. I'm gonna to try to sell it to you a little bit. The silver lining is that you have this opportunity. Um, everybody's doing it. We're all sharing resources. Um, and there's some benefits to teaching online. And here's some of the ones that I personally have kind of carved out. Personally, uh, schedule and geographic flexibility. I've taught my online classes from Jordan, Turkey, Thailand, Alaska, my parents' basement. So um, that's a wonderful value added for me is that I can uh, travel when I need to or when I want to. Um, one personal benefit is transportation costs. Maybe you're spending less on gas. Um, maybe you're not negotiating crowded parking lots anymore. Personally, too, this is an opportunity to develop some new skills, some new teaching knowledge. And for me also, I saw this as a way to softly transition out of full-time teaching into retirement, maybe teaching part-time online from Zimbabwe. So a way to ease into retirement. Professionally, create an archive knowledge, perhaps expand your audiences beyond uh, beyond Guam, beyond um, this region, uh, expand teacher networking, and new income streams. Institutionally, why teach online? I think this gives us an opportunity to serve students with transportation and medical restrictions, um, provide student support or support for students who might need more repetition, um, more iterations of content. Um, when we have it online, this gives the possibility. Also, there's a, a level of, um, of self-pacing that's involved when you're online. Students can complete work, listen to work again um, without, being, without uh, a classroom being slowed down by particular needs of some students. So students can tailor their, um, their learning um, to their particular learning styles a little bit more when they can click, pause, rewind. And lastly, develop knowledge libraries for future teachers and students. Um, Manny talked about a consortium and a mug. This might be where we're headed. And um, Moodling, um, this LMS, is a place where we can do that. All right. Um, I have a Several more slides. These are the last item of my um, outline, which was resources for the road. So um, this might be a slide perhaps you want to take a picture of with your phone. This is what my students do. So um, perhaps these might be places to explore. Again, time permitting. I know we are rushing, but these are the tools that I use um, that I have grown to really appreciate in my online teaching. So Moodle as my learning management system. YouTube, I link videos to my classes all the time from YouTube. I also go to Moodle to learn, or to YouTube to learn Moodle. When I have a question, just type in, how do I post a forum to Moodle? And you've got an answer, you've got 15 tutorials. VoiceThread is the way I deliver my content, my lectures. Again, I'm not using a live requirement. Students don't have to meet me in Zoom or Big Blue Button. They just need to listen to my VoiceThread lectures. So I teach asynchronously. I use SoundCloud to do weekly audio messages. I use Audacity to edit so I sound a little more polished. Um, totally not necessary though. 
PowerPoint, Word, Screencast-O-Matic on occasion. All of these that you see stars next to are ones that are free. And the last thing that you may have noticed um, in the drive-by sightseeing tour of my EN213 class is that I tried to include images. So I use free copyright, free restricted, non-restricted images, and on the bottom of the screen here, you see Clip Art Max and the animated Giphys that are my go-to uh, resources. All right, one more here. Um, opportunities, if the hey, funding Chris. is there, or you can, yes? You have a There's couple questions? questions on Q. Yeah, please, um, I'm not seeing the, maybe I need to click something else to see those questions. I'm not seeing questions on my, my screen. Let me stop sharing. There we go. All right. Are the features Dr. Sant highlighted included in the free version? Um, I'm not sure which, which specific features. Are those, are you referring to Moodle or are you referring to VoiceThread? If, um, Louis, you want to update that question? And Caroline asked, Dr. Sant, can you please indicate again what it is you use? What do you do for each unit presented? Sure, I can go back um, to my course really quickly. And let me just wait for Louis. Okay, so he's asking about free version of Moodle. Um, I don't know that there will be a free version of Moodle. I think your institution um, your school or GDOE has to make that purchase. And then um, you as a teacher will be included as a subscriber to Moodle. And then, and then I believe you'll have the same accesses that I do. Um, maybe Manny can address that a little bit more clearly or um, somebody with knowledge of what uh, Moodle version will be purchased for GDOE. But Caroline, if I could go back and indicate again what it is I do for each unit. So for each unit, I'll just go back to my page real quick. Thanks for stopping me, guys, and um, bringing, calling attention to those questions once again. All right, so let me go down to unit two. And Look once again at my list. All right, so for content delivery for my lectures, I use those voice thread presentations. Also, if I want to give a little audio message to my students, I do that using voice thread or SoundCloud. And this is a example of SoundCloud. Let me see if it'll play for Hello, you. Hello, class. This message is a long one. I don't know if you heard that or not. It said, hello class, this message is a long one. Um, but you can see it fires up and continues across. Um, this is an easy way to post a message. You can also do this through Moodle, um, through a label. Um, so you don't even need to use SoundCloud, which is an outside software. So content delivery is a voice thread lectures, handouts, Handouts also include my notes as a literature professor and as any kind of teacher. I know you all have tons of notes for daily lesson plans. And so it's just a matter of typing up some of those and sharing. I'll show this one. This is an example of a story that we read, Bumba's creation from um, an African culture. And here I've gone page by page, paragraph by paragraph sometimes, um, pulling out um, moments in the story that I would talk about in a face-to-face -face class. So these are in my handwritten notes, and I've had eight years to um, type them out. So again, it might take a little longer for you to develop this kind of archive, or maybe again, you have excellent teacher's aides who can help you do this work. So you don't always have to be live or feel like you have to lecture all the materials. Another way to share your knowledge is by sharing your notes. 
So those are my professor's reading notes. Okay, I also use outside resources. This is an activity URL link. And discussion forums are a way that students teach one another. I've got another question here. Can it do voice to text so it's easier to take notes? Voice to text. I think you're asking if there's a, a, a software that transcribes. I know that Big Blue Button can do transcriptions of, of um, live lectures that can be recorded and shared from semester to semester. Um, if you want to uh, read your notes, then you certainly can. Let me show you that real quick. I'm going to add a resource. This is the quickest way. There's other, other possibilities here. You'll notice you have several options across here. Across this editing, you get more options when you pull down the screen. One way to quickly provide your students with some audio direction is to click on record audio. Your screen should count back the numbers. You can delete it, you can re-record it, but then it'll show up in this box. And all you have to say is click the play button to hear the directions on X assignment. So that's a way to share um, an audio within Moodle rather than using that outside source. I hope that answered your question. Let me see if there's another one here. Can it do voice text? I think we got it. Okay. So let me go back again to my PowerPoint. Dr. Son, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yes. We have Charlena Yanger with her hand raised. I'm going, yes. I'm going to allow her to talk. Please, Charlena, thank you. You may, you may unmute yourself now. I, I'm sorry. That was, that was inadvertently pressed. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you anyway. Perhaps you'll have another question that you can um, type out or questions towards the end. Um, thank you. All right. Back to the PowerPoint. Just for a few more things. Oh, shit. Let me question and answer block that. I think I already showed you this one. Resources and guides. I don't know if this one came up. So let me quickly go through that. This is some of the key resources I used when I transitioned and began to learn to teach myself how to do online teaching. So um, quick guides, models, and rubrics. California State or Chico has some wonderful rubrics that you can use to evaluate your courses as you transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online. And even just reading through these rubrics uh, helps understand helps you understand some of the ways that online learning is different than the face-to-face -face environment. So there's a rubric there, a rubric there. For longer, whoops, too fast, longer, more comprehensive guides. If you have the time, the energy, you can read one of these longer texts. I particularly like um, this PDF that you can find by Googling Online Learning Consortium Guide and delivering high quality education faculty playbooks. So it's a PDF download, 55 pages, but it's really well organized and you can cherry pick moments of it. So it might be, how do I create a schedule for an online class? Or it might be, uh, are there any specific sure. resources for math content? So it has some of those kind of uh, curriculum content specialization resources, as well as design elements. Um, how can I make my classroom more engaging? How do I keep them from um, dropping off in participation? Um, you might find some help in that playbook. And then again, a, not, a longer resources that has um, longer resources. Yep, go ahead, I'm hearing a voice. Yes, hi, Dr. Son. Um, a few of our participants are wondering, is there a PowerPoint um, slide that's supposed to be showing right now? Oh, thank you, or dear me. Right sharing. 
Thanks for stopping me. Yeah, there sure is. Let's try it again. Dr. Salton, you know, while, while you're switching over to a different screen, I wanted to also point yeah. out that um, one of the things that Dr. Salton uses is folder view. So in her course, she uses a folder view that allows students to quickly collapse and expand the course content. So you don't, you try to avoid that scroll of death that, uh, you know, like, oh, I got to go all the way down. So um, if you didn't see it, so when you actually configure the course, you know, it's, you can go by topics, you can do folder view topics. So whatever your choice is, and these are configurable even after the fact, but it's just a way of, of doing a top level organization in within Moodle. So thanks, sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah, thanks, Manny. Can you see my Moodle page again? Yes, it's there. Am I sharing? What, what we All see right. is so the just... ENT 13 Literature, Myth and Culture. Perfect. So let me show the difference between a course that's using the folder and then maybe a template that's just blank. Sometimes this is what you get from, um, we created a shelf for you here. Um, this is an empty shell that has, it doesn't have anything in it whatsoever, organized by topic. But if you like that collapsible folder view that I was using, you can Go to the settings of the course page and choose the appearance. Course format, sorry. Topics format is what's showing now. You would choose a folder view format so that you can hide things from your students and then um, only provide them with one topic at a time. And again, they can expand it when you have information inside of it. Thanks for um, sharing that, Manny. All right, let me try once more to conclude. Sorry, Marissa, I'm trying to wrap things up for you. Let's go back, to screen share once again, hopefully. To the last slide. Okay, are we back on my PowerPoint? Got it, perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, so maybe you've taken a, a photo of this screen as possible resources for professional development. And I showed you this one, but I'll just iterate. This is what um, I've personally gone through, and I, I applaud these particular programs, Learn.org, Online Learning Consortium, and VoiceThread. And then, again, just to iterate what I've been sharing, keep it simple and focused, make it reusable, duplicate with permission, and incorporate rather than recreate. Thank you for your time. Um, I hope it's been useful. And I'd like to now turn the mic and the video over to Dr. Bunton. All right, Dr. Song, can you just go to uh, slide seven real quick? That was the one that we missed. We missed your slide seven. Slide seven of the PowerPoint? Yes, yeah. Sure. I think that's slide seven. Nope. Uh, it was the one with the resources. Uh, there you go, that's the one. That one there? Okay. Pull out your smartphones, take a picture. <laughs> Screenshot. All right, thank you everyone. Um, there will probably be additional time at the end. So again, um, please welcome uh, Professor Bunton. I think my video is coming up. Can you guys see me? Yes, yes we sure can. can. Okay, great. Um, so I don't have a fancy PowerPoint um, tonight, or it's, it's night for me, um, but I'm going to reiterate um, several of the things that Dr. Sant said um, and, and just kind of give you a little bit of a tour of um, one of my Moodle classrooms, one that I'm working in right now as a summer C course. And then um, I wanna keep this as sort of like an open forum where there can be just a lot of questions and feel free everyone to, um, to jump in and ask questions as well. I should give myself, a, give a little bit of background about myself. So um, I have been working and teaching online um, since about 2001. 
um, I started teaching um, for University of Illinois online um, a computer science class, believe it or not, which is so crazy to me now because I could never do that now. Um, but uh, I used Blackboard. Um, earlier in the discussion, um, when Manny was talking, um, people were talking about the differences between different learning management systems. And I've used probably all of them, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. I currently, um, I've used Blackboard pretty extensively. Um, I've used uh, the Sakai through, uh, I'm, I'm full-time at University of Hawaii's Leeward Community College, and we use something called Laulima. Um, and then, of course, I've been using Moodle since University of Guam uh, started it back in, um, started using it, I think, when did we start using uh, Moodle? Maybe 2008 or nine. Um, but I've been teaching online since then. Uh, I, I was teaching at University of Guam um, and it helped put together the very first online, um, fully online English courses um, at, at University of Guam. So that was really exciting. And um, my doctor is actually in educational technology. So um, I, the, my dissertation was specifically <laughs> student perceptions of online and traditional courses at University of Guam. So I've been tied to the university for a really long time. I've got to see various iterations of our um, online, online teaching and I've had the opportunity to work with a ton of different learning management systems. And, um, and so I guess my presentation is pretty quick and easy. Um, I'm going to reiterate, like I said, a few things that um, Dr. Sant said. And basically, I want to just encourage everybody who is, you know, putting their stuff online to try new things. Just try it. Um, try not to get stuck in the idea that, oh my gosh, I have to put this online and I have to change my life and all of these things. You really don't have to change too many things. The beauty with all of the tools and resources that we have available to us now is that your teaching personality can still really shine through in your online environment. So the way that you decide to organize and teach your courses. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as, um, as I show you what I've got going on. So I'm going to start out. I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh, I like this. This is kind of fun. Let me see if it works. So I like to start with jokes sometimes. Do you know why elephants, why you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. I can't hear you guys laughing, but I assume that you all are. Um, so I'll stop that. Anyway, um, let me go back, try to share screen again. And where is, there it is. There's my Moodle course. So can everyone see me or see the, see the course? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I assume you'll stop me if, um, if you're not seeing something that, uh, that you should be. So um, Dr. Sant's course was, is, is really put together with a lot of pretty pictures and, and different things that, um, that really draw the student's eyes in. And I've always been super um, envious of the way she organizes her courses in that way. But I also realized that that's not necessarily the same, my same teaching personality. And so I want you all to realize that you can organize your courses and put them together and have the look the way that you, that really kind of like works for your brain and the way that, that you understand things. So this is a course that I'm teaching right now, um, July 6th through August 8th. And you can see it starts out with Welcome to English 110. Um, and I haven't got it set up as folders. I've got it set up as the, um, uh, the topics settings, but maybe I should put it in folders because it is starting to get a little bit lengthy. Um, but anyway, so I have this original part. This is what students see at the very beginning. Um, I've taken a bunch of uh, quality management trainings um, over the years, and they always want you to, you know, right at the beginning, explain what your expectations are for the course and, and how to get started. So I always have this right here at the beginning. Um, and then I have my announcements. Um, I am really committed to making sure that students understand that anything that's in the announcements or the questions forum, it's my expectation that they understand and have read and will ask questions if they don't understand it. And I, I set the stage for that at the very beginning of each course by having some low risk assignments 
that are attached to making sure students are reading the announcements and asking questions in the questions forum. Um, this is important to me because I want to establish at the very beginning of the class that student that I'm available. I want students to know that they can approach me all the time, anytime, and will understand um, how quickly I'm going to get back to them. Oftentimes, new online teachers especially feel like they need to um, uh, be online 24 seven. I strongly encourage you, or I guess rather, I strongly discourage you from being online 24 seven for your students. Set boundaries so that they have the expectation of that if they wait till the last minute to begin a, a project and try and ask you questions two hours before the project is due, um, that you're probably not going to answer. And, and then that will prevent you from feeling that stress. So what I do is I tell my students, always read ahead and I usually try and provide um, everything with a couple of weeks notice in summer classes. It's a bit different because the time is con condensed, but always read ahead and I will answer every single question posted in the questions forum within 24 hours through the week and 48 hours over the weekend. And so that allows me, I usually check my questions forum like twice a day and then that allows me a peace of mind and then I don't have to stress out about the students um, not uh, getting the answers that they need because they understand initially what it is. So I got ahead of myself a little bit. So I said something about having some low risk assignments that allow students to, um, to become familiar with the tools that you're going to be using. So my very first assignments, you know, have, have them read the syllabus and they have to ask a question in the questions form about the syllabus um, so that I know that they're comfortable with using that. And the first couple of weeks of class or the first week or so of class, I allow myself permission to become completely exhausted because I want to be in contact with those students constantly, um, you know, within the 24 hour period, but like having having enough time to sit down and answer questions from every single student, because that way they begin to understand that if they post a question in the questions form, it's going to be answered. And then once you've established that you can kind of like cruise the rest of the class because they already know that they can ask you questions. And as Dr. Samp mentioned, having this questions forum is a great place for students to, you know, you're not answering and re-answering all the same questions over and over again in email. And then of course, anything that's in the questions forum, students are expected to know whether they ask the question or not. Speaking of questions, do we have any so far? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Something else that I do um, that I find really useful is in my announcements. So this will open up here. Um, every time I open a new unit, I have a little welcome message. Sometimes I post a video with it, sometimes I don't. But with the welcome message, I have a calendar that tells them exactly what is due and when it's due on which date. Now, of course, this is a summer course, so it looks like, so things are very condensed. Um, but they have an idea of what's due. And then I also add information about like, you know, oh, maybe consider seeing a writing tutor, maybe ask some questions. And this gives students a prompt to think, oh, may wow, maybe I should do that. So even things that aren't like actual deliverables that they have to turn into me, they're still working on those types of things. Continue revising, you know, revise one more time. I put all of that into the calendar. So I'm going to leave the announcements. And so that's there for the students. And again, anything that's posted in the announcements, students are expected to know. Um, I have some additional tools here for students. I have the Moodle chat, which they're welcome to use. Um, I have uh, some information about how to navigate registration and transcripts. Um, and then always right below my introductory area, I have a course resources area where the syllabus lives. I have some mini lectures that maybe don't necessarily specifically apply to everything we're talking about in a particular course, but they're links to different lectures and different bits of information. Or like if I get a question about how to use a particular word or how to, how to do something, I, I oftentimes put these lectures in there and I can just refer students to the link to these lectures. Another huge benefit of having your stuff all stored online is that you don't have to always like rewrite and repeat things for students. You can just refer them to a link of something that already exists. Um, I like to use the Excelsior, Excelsior College Online Writing Lab, um, some other things right there. So you can see uh, the different stuff. You can also notice here that something is hidden from students. 
Um, as Dr. Sant was mentioning, um, after we've taught a course for a few times, we typically have resources that we use and then don't use or update and revise. And so it's really cool that like I can decide like mm, this summer, I'm not going to do this this way. I'm going to try something different, but I'm not going to get rid of it. I can just simply hide it from the students. Um, and then I can just have all of these resources at my at my hands. So if you notice, of course, that um, if I switch my role to student, then the students aren't going to see all of that messiness in there. And I think Dr. Sant went over that as well a little bit. So I'll just continue in the role as student for right now. On top of having um, the announcements, having a check our uh, calendar and the announcements for my students, I like to put the due dates directly here um, embedded in Moodle for the different things that I expect them to do or complete. And then another feature of Moodle that I absolutely love are these little check boxes so that students can visually see when they have completed a task or an assignment. And depending on the task or assignment, um, sometimes they'll, the check box will autofill and you can set up the settings that way um, or students can check them off themselves. And I don't know about you, but I love lists and I love to check things off the list. And I've had many students tell me that seeing something visually like that is almost like not only motivating, but also inspiring for them. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, but it appeals to my personality. And so that's why I use it because I'm a huge fan of checking things off. Similar to Dr. Samp, I introduce all the tools that I'm going to use in a course at the very beginning of the course. I, again, have some low risk assignments every time they're using a new tool for the first time and then um, uh, allow them to become familiar with that tool before things get um, a little bit more complicated or complex. I would rather students be focusing on the content of the course than how to use the tools. Moodle is so cool. There are so many great, interesting, awesome things that you can do with Moodle. There are so many amazing things that you can link to, these external um, tools that we have, but it's just like changing a light bulb. You don't need the whole toolbox in order to change a light bulb. So if your course doesn't require all sorts of bells and whistles, just avoid them. Allow the students to focus on the content of the course, and then that will also allow you to focus on the content of the course and being the teacher with the person, the teaching personality that you actually have. So when I first started teaching online, I was, it was right when online teaching was, was pretty, um, pretty new. Um, but over the years, I've seen, you know, all these really cool things that other teachers do, all these bells and whistles that they put on there. And sometimes I'll get this little bit of anxiety, like, oh my gosh, I need to be doing this too. I need to be doing this too. But then I have to breathe and step back and think, will that really benefit my students? Will that help my students in any way? Will introducing an assignment in this way versus a simpler method really change anything? So what I'm trying to say here is avoid the idea that you have to be like competitive with all of the other teachers um, and what they're doing. Do what's right for you. Keep it as simple as possible and your students will really appreciate that as well. If you're busy like, you know, working with the learning management system back and forth all night and then a student asks you a question and you're impatient because you're tired, um, that's probably not the best thing. So again, I'm just strongly encouraging you to, to do what's right for you um, for your particular um, students. I made a couple of notes here. Um, while everyone else was speaking. Um, if you already use YouTube, I have a whole like video on YouTube if you're interested on it about it, but um, that's a great way to create lectures and store lectures for your students. Um, and you're welcome to ask me any questions about that that you might have. You can email me later after, um, after this program. Um, I liked how Manny talked about how you can look at different students um, activity on Moodle, which is so cool because uh, so often students will be like, oh, well, I logged in, just like Manny said, and you can see that they haven't logged in in like three or four days and they've not clicked on a certain assignment. So the tools that are available to you, um, you know, the my dog ate my homework excuse no longer works when you're using these like online tools. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? just play with it. You know, like this is the way I've set up my course. 
I'm always changing, reinventing, and, um, and looking at different ways to, to change things as time allows. Don't become too frustrated if something doesn't work right the first time. And be honest with your students. I mean, they're in a new world too, where everything's online all of a sudden. And um, they, you know, if we're all just a little bit more patient with each other, we can try new things and, 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 be, and be kind of kind to each other in, the, in those ways. Let's see. So yeah, just, just continue, continue to play with it. I had one other thing that I wanted to point out. Oh, um, someone had asked earlier about group projects. I saw that on the, on the notes. Um, a lot of times people are hesitant to do group projects online, but I actually have um, oftentimes better um, results from group projects in my online courses than I do in my face-to-face -face courses um, because students think actually to use all of the different electronic tools at their disposal. Um, and I have some worksheets um, that help students, help guide students through um, their online um, group projects, which are really cool and I'm more than happy to share. Let's see, I had another couple of things. Um, oh, so when we went online last semester, I was already teaching all my University of Guam classes are completely online. I live on Oahu. Um, so like Dr. Sant was saying, you know, when you're teaching online, you can teach from anywhere, which is, which is really cool. Um, and I traveled all summer um, teaching online all summer, which is was just really incredible. Um, but when I, everything went online for my live classes, like at Leeward Community College, for me, it wasn't a stressor because I actually set up all my courses initially to be offered online. So all of my students, you know, oftentimes we teach the same courses over and over. Um, and so sometimes I'll have a course that I'm teaching online and it will have that same course that I'm teaching live. I just share all of my online resources in the same way with my face-to-face um, uh, -face students as my online students. So everything is there. So when we made the transition um, at the end of this, uh, in the middle of the spring semester with COVID, um, my students, my face-to-face -face students didn't have any um, serious challenges and have reduced anxiety because they were already used to using the online interface. And I don't know, you know, the specifics about how DOE is going to handle everything, but um, I know that like the more that familiar students become with these online resources, even if we go back to a totally face-to-face -to -face environment, um, it, it wouldn't be a terrible thing to continue keeping your resources online and perhaps integrating the online tools that we have into your face-to-face -face classrooms because if something like this happens again when we have this like crazy shutdown all of a sudden um, it makes the transition much easier. So that's my what my classroom looks like. I'm going to stop my screen share here and um, I know that we've been online together now for over two hours and I know that that can get a little bit exhausting. Um, most of what I have to say is really similar to what's already been said. So I'd just like to open this up entirely for, um, for questions that anybody has and I would strongly encourage everyone to um, answer one another if you have ideas. I learn so much more from these webinars from other people than I do when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm presenting, I, I still learn so much more from other people. So, any questions? It's always tough to be the last person. You can also <laughs> raise your hand and we'll allow you to speak. <laughs> You're not alone, Marissa. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have one hand raised. Her name is Ms. Alicia Whittaker. Ms. Alicia Whittaker, you are allowed to talk now. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, um, I wanted to know what were the resources that you had for the online group projects, um, just for guides for, for teachers? Yeah, so what I do for my, um, uh, with Moodle, there are ways to formally um, set, set up a group project where they can just see their own things. Um, but I do things a little bit more informally. Again, that just speaks to my personal teaching style. And so what I'll often do 
is set up forums. You can have like different discussion forums. And I'll say that one team does is, you know, like the yellow team, the blue team, the green team. But I actually leave the forums open so that everyone can see what other teams are doing. But there are ways to privatize those and, um, uh, and, and make those so only people within the teams themselves can see. I also have something called um, a learning team charter that whenever I do a group project, it's, um, it's a document that team members have to work together to fill out prior to actually beginning the project so that they've already set the ground rules for what their teams have. And if, um, I'm not sure who I would email that to, but if someone would let me know, I'll just, it's, it's an open educational resource that I've created. I've done a lot of OER training. And so um, documents that I create um, that I'm willing to share are, are that way. So you're, you guys are welcome to have it. And I, if someone would just let me know who to send it to, I'm happy to do so. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Here's a question that popped up down here. Are there any other participants that would like to raise their hand for any questions? So I see something um, from a Mr. Chargoloff. Is Moodle able to fit standards-based grading? Are quizzes and assignments limited to a point system? Um, and can we override the scores? So I personally haven't used that feature in Moodle myself, but most of the other learning management systems that I have used do have the ability, you do have the ability to override. Um, that's probably a better question for Manny. I can answer that as well. Oh, yes, great. you can override scores. So you can change it. Um, if it's a 12 question quiz, but you want to um, change the point value and have uh, two extra credit points, you might set it out of 10. You can also override it on a curve and just change uh, the grades in the grade book if you found um, there's a question you want to throw out, et cetera. The next question here is, can you repeat the website you just mentioned, Dr. Brown? So I'm not sure about a website that I mentioned. I think I, I might have said something about open educational resources. Is that what the question was about? There we go, it's popped up. See, when you keep the film out of your place. And... Oh, okay. So regarding the website, um, if it was about open educational resources, I strongly encourage you to just Google, like, um, what are open educational resources? And you will um, learn a ton about um, how you can create documents that then you're willing to share, um, to share out and the way that other teachers who are using them can give you credit. It's like a, um, it's like a way of citing your sources when you're using sources from, from other instructors and when you're borrowing ideas. Um, so like what Dr. Sant was talking about, um, you know, you want to not necessarily recreate things. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, but with permission, you can use the resources that are already out there, which I think is just awesome. How do you handle or administer formal assessment for online classes to eliminate cheating possibilities? Um, so for that question, I, um, I'm really lucky in that the courses that I teach online um, are pretty hard to cheat in. So I teach both English composition um, and I che teach speech or communication. And so students are giving speeches for me online. Um, students are writing papers for me. Now, of course, anyone who has, um, who uses Turnitin, that's one way to help eliminate um, some of the cheating. But also, I just ask a lot, I use a lot of prompts throughout um, my courses so that I really get a great understanding of students' writing styles and their abilities prior to any sort of formalized paper. And if you've graded writing for very long, you can start to notice like when a student writes one way and then all of a sudden it switches. Um, but I honestly, apart from, uh, uh, apart from some plagiarism, um, I really, and, and minor plagiarism, I haven't had um, a terrible time with cheating. And then in classes where I have quizzes, I actually, in tests that are done online, I actually create the quizzes and tests in a way that I encourage students to work together. Um, because in the real world, let's be honest, we're all working together and collaborating all of the time anyway. 
and it's much more of a hassle for me to create something where they have to go somewhere to a testing center. It's a hassle for them. So if they want to work together, that's awesome. I encourage it. But as a result, I make the quizzes and tests a lot more difficult than I would if they were just working alone. Hopefully that kind of answers your question. So think about it from a different an angle, I suppose. Um, my online classes at Capella University, all the professors use the same format in their classes in which I'm very comfortable with and all I need to do is focus on the format. Yes, um, I agree. Having everyone use the same format is really great. Um, at Leeward Community College right now through the UH system, we've created these five week online classes um, where we have to do this training. And even though I've been teaching online forever, um, we had to learn the formatting that they wanted us to use for these classes. It's this like accelerated program. And so that when students open their La Lima page, that's our learning management system, uh, they see everything looking the same um, as it did in their previous class, as it did in their previous class, which is really cool. And when I was getting my doctorate, um, it was similar for me as well. It was just, you know, each class was the same. If there were a way to do that um, at DOE, that would be really cool. Um, I don't know that we have the time at this point to put something like that together, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Having similar formatting is great. Um, oh, do you have any recommendations about grading online writing? In the past, I found that even with specific due dates, I would receive such a large amount of writing at a time, it can be difficult to get through it all. Um, I don't, and Dr. Sant can answer to this as well, um, I don't find it any different, different to read online writing assignments as when I'm doing a face-to-face um, course because I've always had due dates where students have been turning in everything at once anyway. Um, but for us as online teachers, we want to make sure that we're scheduling the time to, to spend with those papers. I know that for myself, um, some, I never grade more than five papers at a time because otherwise I start to get snarky. Um, and I also set a timer if they're, you know, where I only give myself so many minutes um, per paper. Now, if I'm just grading discussion forums, so this is the, the really great thing that I've learned after um, that I kind of mentioned earlier. At the beginning of the semester, I answer all their questions immediately. I respond to their biographies, all that, all that is there. And then as we get to like the discussion forums where they're writing a lot and discussing back and forth, I don't answer everybody. I don't reply to everybody. Typically I reply to one or two in a thread and then Moodle has this little thing where you can star and you know, recognize that they have created a substantive response. Um, and so that's really cool. And that's also a huge time saver because it's a lot easier to read and not then have to type out a whole response um, than it is to spend all of that time. So you wanna figure out how to use your time wisely. And Dr. Sant, did you have any other suggestions that you do for online grading? Okay, um, I agree. I use um, similar techniques to Marissa. Forums is one place that can add up very quickly, especially if you have a forum every week. So uh, choosing a rating system, Moodle forums allow you to rate. So you just kind of uh, give students a rubric and say an 11 means this, a 10 means this, a 9 means this. That can speed up your grading. Um, also, you can divide and conquer. One thing that I've done to help eliminate the amount of grading uh, of writing is to divide my class in half, have one class, one group responsible for posting new content and the other group responsible for responding to those students and then flip it the next week. So that students get a little bit of a break and you're also grading half the work. Um, that's one way that helps with um, the amount of writing and reading that you're gonna be doing in, a, in that online environment. Also, for online grading, you're going to be spending more time on the screen. Uh, it's a transition when you're not printing out the papers, or maybe you will feel like you have to print out all the papers and mark them. But I just use word track changes, and I've developed a, a most common mistakes Word document. So I open up that Word document on one side and the student paper on the other, and then I can cut and paste when I see those most common errors. And I, I learned this from Marissa. So that's another technique that she taught me. So I hope that answers your question. The next question here is, do you have any suggestions for courses that do have the burden of proving, providing proof of comprehension or of heard, 
of techniques others have used, i.e. Civil War factoring chemistry? I don't know. Um, an option I heard in a conversation uh, a, um, for um, the global learning um, group was uh, faculty asking students to use their camera and turn it down to look at the work and the students completing the work as a video or taking a screenshot of their video to prove that it's actually them that's completing the work. So it might be a WhatsApp post, it might be um, a short video. Um, I think that's what you're asking is kind of the, the proof and making sure that the student is doing the work and um, not somebody else. I think that's what that question means. Marissa, did you have any other comments for that? Yeah, I've heard similar, similar things. Um, coming from a, you know, a background in, in composition, having students write, um, you know, to explain uh, their, their comprehension is always really helpful, but I can certainly understand, like if you're a chemistry teacher, your goal is not to sit and read a bunch of, of long essays. Um, I use YouTube a lot in my classes and have students record themselves not only giving speeches, but doing other things. And so like maybe you have like a chemistry project that you want to see them do. So have them record themselves doing the project, perhaps. Um, there's really simple free tools that exist out there. Um, and uh, just finding them and going to things like this, like uh, we're always learning new, new tricks and, and information. Oh, um, I'm not sure. It yeah, says, does Moodle, yeah, does Moodle allow for parents or guardians access? I would assume this is completely an assumption, and so DOE would have to answer this um, that anytime a minor is involved in something online, the parents are going to have access and should be able to see all of the information. I'm not sure how your grade books work and, and all of that. I do know that um, I teach early college for um, uh, in the UH system where we go out into high schools and take college classes into high school classrooms. And we have a thing where students, um, where students' parents actually sign off and say that, hey, my student, my child is to be treated as an 18 year old plus. But because this is DOE, I'm sure that that would be a little bit different. So definitely please talk to your administrators about that. I'm sure there's something that will be done. Other questions? I'm sorry, it's getting dark in my house. <laughs> I've realized that you can't hardly see me now. So what's next? So I used to be well, a motivational be speaker. <laughs> and I want to just okay, say actually, that- Okay, um, actually, Ms. Oh, L can actually respond to that question that was mentioned oh, earlier. I'm gonna have her sit here and she can answer. Sorry for the interruption. Oh no. I mean, it's me. Okay, so that is a really good question. One of the things that we want to be concerned about is that as we take a look at the implementation of the three learning models, I know that there could be a third or, or fourth or even higher of students using online. Um, the, the online platform, one of the things that we have in place, and we've had this since the E-Rate program uh, came about right around the, the 2000s area, we have something called the acceptable use policy. And we're very concerned, right, um, you know, that we don't want students using the resources that the department has purchased for things outside of their uh, educational purpose, their assignments, their courses, and, and those kinds of things. So what we intend to do is that there needs to be 100%, not only with the students using online, the students on remote learning, as well as the students that are doing face-to-face. -face. So every single student in, in all our 41 schools will have to have that acceptable, acceptable use policy signed and uh, has to be um, signed and um, you know, uh, by the parents as well. So that's a very, very important, very critical uh, piece that we have to ensure that occurs prior to um, anything online or, or any of the other um, formatting that we're going to provide. So yes, we are definitely in that, in, in that direction and, and have been for the last couple of years. Thank you. As I was mentioning um, before, I, I was a motivational speaker for a long time, so I understand that sometimes I can be indulgently optimistic, as I've been told. Um, but I do want to say that um, as much, uh, and I, I'm, I know I'm reiterating this, but 
as irritating perhaps as it will be to put your stuff online um, right now, there are so many amazing benefits that you're going to reap. Um, I oftentimes think I get to know my online students better than my face-to-face -face students simply because, you know, when you're in a traditional classroom setting, there's always those, no matter how good your classroom management is, there's always those one or two students that are kind of taking over the room. Um, in an online setting, that's not necessarily possible. I mean, they can still post a lot, but those quiet students have to post, you know, a certain amount as well. So just being able to get to know your students even better can be incredibly rewarding, even if that's the only thing. Um, and then having all of your resources, don't think that you have to put everything together overnight, but slowly, like as Dr. Sant was saying, over the course of eight years, she's developed this beautiful course. Um, and, and you will start to put those resources together and have them and just having them at your fingertips is so cool. And it will save the, you know, a lot of work at the front end it will save you so much time on the back end. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? See in the chat. Yeah, I see a great um, note in the chat. It says students can feel like they have you all to themselves, and that's a really great feeling for those who are typically quiet, and I certainly agree. Yeah. As you move forward, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm sure all of our contact information will be shared. Um, and yeah, take advantage of the cool opportunities that lie ahead. It looks like we're wrapping up. There's a lot of thank yous coming through. <laughs> yeah. through and I think we've all super saturation of information. So thank you all for inviting us. It's been really interesting to talk to a room of such a diverse teachers. I don't think I've ever had the experience to talk to um, sixth grade teachers and high school teachers, math, science, uh, English, all across the board. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, here we go. All right, so thank you, Dr. Son and Dr. Brown for sharing uh, all of your resources. Um, I see that um, probably Mr. Manning um, might have left. Um, did Amanda want to make any closing remarks before we end our session? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlos Titano. I'm with the Global Learning and Engagement Office. I just want to thank Dr. Brown, Dr. Sant, and Manny for a wonderful presentation. And I also want to wish the best to all the teachers and administrators at GDOE. Um, again, this is uh, uncharted waters for everyone, so I wish you all the best. We will send out the contact information for everyone so we can stay in touch and support each other through the next few months. And good luck and be safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Carlos Titano, for sharing your closing remarks. I think Ms. Eloise would like to say her as well. Thank you again, Carlos, and to everyone. Um, we appreciate the time, the effort, and the opportunity to have a very strong and engaging conversation with you on the idea of using Moodle. And we look forward, hopefully, to more uh, future partners and, and collaboration. Thank you so much. And thank you again to Tam and, and uh, Felix for providing the support on the technical side to address all the questions that were coming through and, and being fielded as we uh, went along the training. Thank you. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Carlos. Um, before we leave, uh, we posted up the uh, post evaluation form right now. And uh, we're just gonna leave the chat open for about 10 more minutes so that you can have access to the link. Okay, all right, thank you.